Good afternoon and welcome to this session entitled 56 Year Love Affair Revelations. It is my immense pleasure to introduce Dr. John A. White, Jr., Distinguished Professor of Industrial Engineering and Chancellor Emeritus at the University of Arkansas. Before I, I turn it over to him, I want to highlight just some of the um, many accomplishments in his bio. The bio that's in the program is a very condensed version of the, of the real story. In his 56-year career as an engineering educator, Dr. White has taught over 4,000 engineering students, co-authored six textbooks, and hundreds of research papers. He is a fellow of three professional societies, and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. As you will soon learn, he is passionate about teaching and has been recognized with a top teaching award at both the Georgia Tech and the University of Arkansas. Now that would be an impressive resume for any engineering educator. Don't you agree? <laughs> yes. But he did this. And along the way, he also founded and directed a consulting company served as a member of the board of directors on six companies' boards, including Fortune 500 companies such as Eastman Chemical, J.D. Hunt, and Motorola. He served as the dean of engineering at Georgia Tech, led the engineering directorate at the National Science Foundation, and served as the chancellor of the, the University of Arkansas for 11 years. He came to the university with the threat that he would change things, and he certainly did, as Chancellor, Dr. White transformed the University of Arkansas and its academic focus. His campaign for the 21st century raised $1 billion, which funded the creation of the Honors College, endowed the Graduate School and the University Library, added 132 tenure and tenure track faculty positions, created over 1,700 student scholarships and fellowships, and funded millions of dollars in brick and mortar improvements. Under his tenure, the university grew in almost every academic statistic, and that started an upward trajectory that continues today. For the last 11 years, Dr. White has just been a faculty member in the Department of Industrial Engineering, where he continues to teach and provide classroom experiences that his students describe as life-changing. As my colleague, friend, and mentor, I can testify to his immense integrity, compassion, and wisdom. And I have never met anyone who is this hardworking. He gives generously of himself in everything he does, and he has left a mark on many, many people throughout this remarkable career. And I think after you hear him today, you will count yourselves among those if you don't already. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John White. Now, for full disclosure, you recognize that you just heard the introduction from my granddaughter, actually great-granddaughter, academic great-granddaughter, that is, which means that Jessica Matson there is your great-aunt, and you need to treat her with immense respect. But uh, I've been very, very fortunate over my career, and I look out and I see so many individuals who have helped this be a wonderful journey, and in fact, it to do what I'm asked to do today, to combine 56 years and summarize that in 90 minutes is a great challenge. And I told Tish, her greatest challenge is going to keep me on schedule. Reminds me of my first trip to Japan where I went down to see Kyoto Nara area there, and we had a sprightly gentleman who was our tour guide, and he said, we'll see many temples and shrines today, and you'll want to spend a lot of time there. But remember, our objective today is to stay on schedule. So I'm going to try as best I can to stay on schedule. Um, I really should have titled this my journey as an engineering educator, but I thought it would be a, more salacious if I made it a 56-year love affair. But then when I did that, my wife was very concerned because she thought <laughs> I was talking about our 56 years, which if she hadn't been so stubborn would have been 57 years. But that's, you'll get to that a little later in my presentation. So let's start with my family. I am the son of educators. My mom and dad were K-12 through educators. Together they had 70 years combined service in the public school systems of Arkansas. 
Um, so I grew up around educators, but I was going to be an engineer. And so I went off to the University of Arkansas and graduated and went to work with Eastman Kodak's chemicals operations in East Tennessee, Tennessee Eastman Company in Kingsport. And uh, so I had my life planned out. I was going to be an engineer and uh, perhaps I would even become the CEO of Eastman Kodak, you know. So some things happened though that changed that along the way. And one of those was on February 23rd, 1963. The last Saturday in February, a cold and rainy day, I might add, when my boss at Tennessee Eastman Company went trout fishing with the department head of industrial engineering at Virginia Tech, Herb Manning. Buck Newsom, my department head, loved to trout fish. And so he and Herb were there fishing on that cold, rainy Saturday morning. And Herb said, I've got a problem. I need someone to teach during spring quarter or on the quarter system. The National Guard unit in Southwest Virginia had been mobilized and sent to Berlin, Germany because of conflict that developed there. Uh, and he lost two instructors. And for reasons that I'll never know, Buck said to Herb, there's a fellow who works for me, would be a great teacher. You should give him a call. And so Herb did, he called me and I said, well, I need to check with my fiance. And so at noon that day, I went over to Dobbins Bennett High School there in Kingsport, had some sandwiches and Mary Lib, who was teaching there, came down, got in the car with me. I told her about the phone call and she said, well, you should do it. And I said, but what about our wedding? because we had already sent out the invitations for our wedding. We were to be married on April 13th, 1963. She said, well, you'll just have to commute. And I uh, said, are you sure? She said, yes, you, this is your chance to go to graduate school. And I know you want to go. So I called her back and I said, I will under one condition. And that is that you would support me until I complete my master's degree. He said, I will. And so off I went. Off I went to Virginia Tech, which at that time was VPI. And uh, I was there for, it was on a quarter system, three and a quarter years, the one quarter being the spring quarter of 1963. I remember very well walking into my very first class. I'll never forget it. And by the end of that, I knew what I was put on earth to do. It was not to be an engineer in industry. It was to join my mom and dad and be an educator, to join my wife to be and be an educator. As it turns out, to join my sister, who's a math teacher, to be an educator. So things were pretty well set, but there occurred a something that was another defining moment for me. You see, I wanted to go to graduate school but every university I applied to turned me down. I applied to Oklahoma State, University of Oklahoma, Texas A&M, to Missouri, to Auburn, to Alabama, to Mississippi State, to Georgia Tech, to Clemson, the University of Florida, <laughs> LSU. All had turned me down, including Virginia Tech. <laughs> and yet, Buck said to Herb, there's a fellow who works for me, who'd be a great teacher, you should give him a call. So I had a chance to go to graduate school. Now, I learned why I had been rejected by every university. I learned that by accident. Being a faculty member, I had access to student files. I went in to pull the file of a student in my class and accidentally pulled my file and opened it and there was a letter from the acting department head who's, and the letter said, do not admit him to graduate school. He'll be a cancer on your program. He will destroy the morale in your program. We would never admit him to graduate school at Arkansas. 
Well, this particular professor and I obviously did not have a good relationship. <laughs> so let me tell you about that relationship. I was taking statistics from him, and the first test he said it will be closed book, open tables. So I'm taking the test, and I see him going around checking tables, and I looked at mine quickly, gave him my book, got the test back, it said 80 minus 20, 60. I went to see him. I said, why did I lose 20 points? He said, for cheating. I said, what did I do? He said, you had something in the tables. I said, I looked at the tables when you were coming around. There wasn't anything there that would be a problem. He said, no, no. There was something. I said, I'll be right back. Left his office, went over to my apartment, got the book, came back to show him that what was in the tables was a cartoon character. Those of you who may have seen me give some of these presentations before, it was Norman Dunderhead, my little cartoon character. In fact, later on I developed a series. I gave presentations. Norman Dunderhead designs a layout. Norman Dunderhead goes to college. Norman Dunderhead does all of these things. Had all of his friends. So I had this cartoon character drawn, and I said, look, it's just a cartoon. I told you you shouldn't have anything on the tables. I said, that's not fair. He said, get out of my office. So I went to the department head and complained about it. It didn't do any good. I got a C in the course, but I made a big mistake after that because I had him for a follow-on course in statistical quality control. I went to see him and I said, look, I want to show you that I learned the material. I love the material. I'm going to make an A in your course. I had the second highest grade in the class. He gave me a B plus. You'd think that I would have learned by now, but I had him the next semester for production control. <laughs> went back to see him and I said, I came really close this time I'm getting an A. Well, my average was 20 points higher than anyone else in the class. And he gave me a C for poor professional attitude. And I had no appeal because then he was the acting department head. He told Alpha Phi Mu, our honor society, that could not bring into, or he would resign as their faculty advisor. So when I saw that letter, I realized I'm going to show him what I'm capable of. And so as it turned out, as I was being inducted to be the president of the Institute of Industrial Engineers, I was up on the head table, looked out, and here he came walking up the main aisle. <laughs> so I stepped down and walked out to see him. He said, I'm so proud of you. You were always one of my favorite students. <laughs> I called him by name and I said, you've had a big influence on my life. <laughs> and I went back and then continued to give the presentation. But that was a defining moment. Just as that trout fishing trip that Buck and Herb were on was a defining moment for me. So I go off to Ohio State after completing my master's degree at, at uh, Virginia Tech. I had a great experience there. Uh, taught all the way through in the summers work at what was then called North American Aviation, their military operations research group, and consulted with them during the, the year. But then when I finished up my doctorate, I had to make a decision of where I was going to go, and it turned down, it came down to a choice between going back to Virginia Tech or going to Purdue. And because of the faculty members that were at Virginia Tech, who I knew well, had great respect for, uh, we chose to go back to Virginia Tech and had just a great experience there. Well, what I had not realized was that that instructor position that I held when I was there from 1963 to 1966 was a tenure track position, tenure track instructor position. So when I came back, they said, look, you were in our system in which it was five years up or out, and now it's changed to six years up or out, but because you were in it, you get to decide do you want to stay under the old system or go with the new system? I said, I'll stay with the old system. I came in in January, and that year counted as a year. The next year, I was up for tenure and promotion. A year and a half after finishing my doctorate, I was tenured and promoted to associate professor. Those were the days, my friend. <laughs> Those were the days. So different today. So different today. So there, five years and then had to make another decision. It turns out, unfortunately, we had a department head who was not very good that we, we brought in. I'm not, go by name, don't go back and look up here, <laughs> please. But of a small department of 15, I was the eighth one to leave. And then when I left, then the dean changed the department head. Um, but it came down to going to 
Purdue or going to Georgia Tech. In my field at the time was facilities layout, facilities planning, material handling. There were two giants in the field, one at Purdue, Riddell Reed, and one at Georgia Tech, Jim Apple. And both of those universities were wanting to recruit me to be the successor to either Rudy or Jim. This now was in 1975. It turned out that both of them died in 1977. And suddenly I was the top dog, literally, in, in that field in academe in the U.S. And it opened up all kinds of opportunities for me. But we chose Georgia Tech over Purdue because of Atlanta versus West Lafayette. And my, my wife, even today, feels like Atlanta was a bit too far north for us. <laughs> we just didn't like cold weather. And having been at Ohio State and at Virginia Tech, she was ready to go south. So off we went, and what a difference it made for us. So I was at, on the faculty at Georgia Tech 22 and a half years. But there was a three-year period there, the most significant three-year period of my professional career, which I had the opportunity to go to the National Science Foundation and lead the engineering directorate. Um, and that had such an impact on me. It almost didn't happen. I was a candidate to be Dean of Engineering at the University of Florida. And when I was encouraged to apply, I did. I didn't realize that my boss at Georgia Tech was also applying for it. <laughs> we were, there were five of us. He was one of the five. I was as well. It was very awkward. Uh, <laughs> and they narrowed it down to two. A Wynn Phillips, who was the mechanical engineering department head at Purdue, and myself. And I had really developed a, a great relationship with the provost, but I, I called Bob and I said, Bob, you need to offer the job to Wynn Phillips. What? Why? I said, I'm the high-risk candidate. I said, I've never been a department head. I have no idea if I can even tolerate being an administrator. I have no clue about that. And if I come there and I don't like it, I don't have a fallback position. I'm giving up an endowed chair position and coming there to be the dean. And I don't even know what deans do. <laughs> but I have the chance to go to the National Science Foundation and head up the engineering directorate. And I'll get a chance to find out whether I can tolerate doing administrative work or not. And so I'm going to do that. So I go, I go to NSF. And let me tell you what a difference that made in me. When I went there, it was all about me. It was me, 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 me my courses, my research, my students, my publications, my career, my... But I got to NSF and I went through a transformation. It became we and us and our country. It was, I realized that this country, the United States of America, we needed to make some significant changes in order to be competitive in a world economy. It was very clear. The brightest half of our population was sitting out engineering and science in general. Women were not joining us. And by every measure, it was the brightest half of our population that we could not continue along those lines. So I invited 12 women to join me to come in. Uh, Sheila Whitnall was one of those uh, from MIT. And, and Sheila and I developed a great relationship. So I said, look. I'm going, to, I'm going to do some things. I'm going to try to make a difference here. And if you don't tell me what to do, I'll probably do some things that are wrong. So you tell me what I need to do. And they said, you need to start right here. You need to have women who are program officers and division directors and, and all. And so we set about doing it. And as I went through that, you know, I became a strong advocate for women and underrepresented minorities. And um, I, I had all the program officers and division directors together, and I said, why should we expect that faculty at HBCUs are going to know how to write a winning proposal to NSF? They haven't had mentors. They haven't had people who've helped train them in how to do that. 
I want to know, will anyone adopt an HBCU as well as a Latino Hispanic serving institution? Well, and I had more volunteers than there were institutions. I said, I want you to go and spend time with them and to show them what it takes to write a winning grant proposal to NSF. What I found was the reason that MIT got so much research was because they wrote so many proposals. Their acceptance rate was no different than others. It's just that they persisted. Whereas so many people, if they got one rejection, they'd say, I'm no good. I'm not going to be able to do it and would give up. So I learned a lot through that process. And so I became a strong advocate to the point that I was criticized nationally as doing social engineering in my position at NSF. Um, but my advocacy has continued since I was at NSF. When Howard Massey came in to be the director, I, was, I went up to be the acting deputy director for six months between Eric Block and Walter. And Walter I had known for years, an African-American physicist, and I said, Walter, you don't need to carry this banner uh, for African-Americans. You let me do it. It's folks who look like me that have created this problem we've got with women with underrepresented minorities. It's going to take folks like me stepping up to change this. We shouldn't just turn to those who've been underrepresented and say, you've got to change the world. It's those of us who look like me who've got to make those changes. And so as I went through that, my definition also of diversity has really expanded. It includes more than how you look. It includes how you learn, uh, what you've experienced, where you were born, what you believe, what your strengths and weaknesses are, what your personality type, and more. There, we need to have a very broad definition of diversity and inclusion. It's not just about what it looks like when you look at someone's driver's license, okay? And so that has continued with me and drove the way that I've functioned in my, pers uh, my positions as Dean of Engineering at Georgia Tech and certainly as Chancellor at the University of Arkansas. But when I went to Georgia Tech, and I had been there on the faculty, but it took going away and being away for three years and looking back to see that the difficulty we had at Georgia Tech is we thought we were really good. And we were, but we weren't great. We took great pride in saying we're the best engineering program in the South. We even had over in the bookstore t-shirts being sold that said Georgia Tech, the MIT of the South. And so when I went in as dean and I had a meeting of the engineering faculty, I said, I don't want to hear this anymore about being the best engineering program in the South. I want us to focus on being the best engineering program in the world. I will not be happy until I can go to MIT and buy a t-shirt that says we're the Georgia Tech of the North. <laughs> that you need to raise your sights. Raise your expectations. Set your goals higher. And so I said, five-year goals. When I came in as, as the dean in 1991, I said five goals, five-year goals. By 1997, we would. We would double the number of BS degrees to women under our seminaries in five years. So we're already awarding more degrees to women than anyone else in the country. Yes, but percentage-wise, we're not where we need to be. We're already awarding more degrees to underrepresented minorities than other than University of Puerto Rico at my guess and NCANT. Yes, but percentage-wise, we're not where we need to be. Need to double the number of PhD degrees awarded. Do this in five years. We need to double the number of underrepresented minority and women faculty members to do that in five years. We need to double the annual research expenditures. We need to triple the number of National Academy of Engineering members on our faculty. And we, wanted, we need to be included in the top five in US News and World Report's graduate engineering rankings. We were 13th at the time. All the department heads except two laughed. Those two didn't laugh. One was John Jarvis, who was an industrial engineering department head. He was a good friend of mine, been for years. And Jean-Louis Chameau didn't laugh. I just hired him to be a civil engineering department head from Purdue, and he didn't feel like he'd been there long enough he could laugh. And so he didn't laugh. Well, fast forward, five years later, We didn't double the number of interim degrees to women. We increased it 84%. We didn't double the number of degrees to African-Americans. We increased it 73%.
We increased the number of Hispanic Latinos 74%. We more than doubled the number of PhD degrees awarded. We didn't double the number of women faculty. We increased at 80%. And we didn't, increase, we didn't double the number of minority faculty who increased at 50%. We more than doubled the annual research expenditures. We not only tripled, we quintupled the number of National Academy mentoring meetings, members, and we were ranked fifth in U.S. News World Report's rankings. I got a call from the provost, said congratulations. I said, Mike, if we'd done what we said we should do on GREs, we'd be ranked in the top three. He said, can't you even take pleasure? I said, not when it's within our reach and grasp to be the top ranked public university. I know we can't get past Stanford and MIT, but we can be that. He said, just try to enjoy it. I said, no, no, we've got to continue. <laughs> then I left, and I, <laughs> I, I went to Georgia Tech. I mean, from Georgia Tech, went back to Arkansas. That was not an easy thing either. I got a call from the chief financial officer from the University of Arkansas system. He had been the chief financial officer in the Georgia system, knew me. He said, the chancellor position is open, and I'd like to nominate you. I said, I have no interest in the job. I have the best job in the world as an engineering educator. I'm the Dean of Engineering at Georgia Tech. I've got wonderful faculty, got wonderful associate deans and department heads. The students, two thirds of the students are majoring in engineering, half the faculty engineering faculty. I don't have to deal with athletics. I don't have to deal with the legislature. I mean, I have got a wonderful job. I don't want to do it. He said, well, Alan Sugg, I said, I know Alan Sugg. He was student body president when I was there. He was Sigma Chi, I was Sigma Nu. He's from Helena, he was a pole vaulter. He was a business major. I voted for him for student body president. But you tell Alan I'm not interested in the job. So then I got a call from Alan. And I said, Alan, did you not get the message? Oh, well, I heard it, but I don't believe it. He said, I want to come to Atlanta and meet with you and your wife and talk about it. I said, you're wasting your time. There's no reason for you to come. He said, well, I'm coming to Atlanta. Will you at least go to dinner with me? I said, sure, we'll go. So we did. I had a nice time. Dropped him off at the Marriott Marquis Hotel. Said, thank you for dinner. I've got no interest in the job. So he called me later and said, no, still not interested. Call me again. I said, what is it about the word no you don't understand, Alan? I don't understand this at all. I'm not, I don't want to be a chancellor. So then he called in December. And he said, look, I know that you and your wife are worried about people finding out that you're so you, And you think that ACC basketball is so great, you've never seen a basketball game until you've been to Bud Walton Arena and seen the racebacks play. And you need to come, and the Tyson family will send their jet out and pick you up and bring you back. You'll be in the Tyson box. It's in December. All the folks are gone. You can just see a basketball game. I was really tempted. And I said, no, I know what you're trying to do. <laughs> so then he calls in January, and it was a Wednesday night, and he said, this is my last call. The search committee wanted me to call you one more time to find out why you're refusing to come visit your alma mater. I said, Alan, that's a low blow. <laughs> he said, will you at least discuss it with Mary Lib? I said, okay. So I told her, and she said, we've got to go. Why? She said, uh, I think you're coming across, you think you're too good for them. I said, that's not what this is about. If I go out there and they make me the offer, I'm going to turn it down or I'll even withdraw during the search. And if I don't go at all, I'm just making a statement about me, about what I want to do, as opposed to a statement about the University of Arkansas. She said, I don't think they see it that way. Yeah, well, the difficulty is also they have the most open sunshine laws. That as soon as they get a letter, they're going to post it on the web. She said, they're going to meet on Monday. It's not that long. I said, yeah, but there are a number of faculty members who are here, particularly women and minority faculty who are here because I'm the dean. And they know I'm in their report. And I'm going to do anything I can to help them be successful. She said, I think they'll understand because it's your alma mater. I said, I don't know. And then she said, if 
you don't do it, I'm afraid someday you'll regret it. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, okay. I'll go upstairs and I'll print out my resume and I'll send a letter. She said, and you're not going to go, right? I said, no, we're not going. I'll just, I'll send it. So I did and I, I FedExed it to him in Little Rock to delay it getting to the campus. I sent it on Thursday, he got it on Friday. And he flew up on Sunday and the search committee met on Monday. Monday, she was visiting her parents in East Tennessee, and I was in their dean's meeting in D.C. I get back Tuesday, and she got back before I did, and our answering machine was full. It turns out this Tuesday morning in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, John White is one of the five finalists for the job at Arkansas, or going to be interviewed for him. And it was on national public radio and all. And so... I got back and I mean it really hit the fan then. Oh boy, it was really difficult. So I called Alan. I said, "Look, we're in the midst of a campaign, and um, I only have one time that I can come see you in the next two months. And it's in two weeks." He said, "We weren't planning on interviewing that quickly." I said, "If you're going to interview me, you are, because that's really it. I don't have any other availability." So I said, "Okay, we'll do it." Well, to make a long story much shorter. Uh, I went out and I was interviewed by the search committee. And the first question asked was Bud Edwards, who was then the vice chancellor for university advancement. And this is what he, his question was. Tell me, Dr. White, why are you so interested in the job? <laughs> and like you, I laughed. It was spontaneous. I knew I shouldn't have laughed, but I mean, I, I said, you think I'm here to convince you to offer me the job. No, no, no. I'm here to see if you can convince me I should have any interest in the job. Because I will have no interest in the job until I am convinced there's going to be a commitment to make the University of Arkansas as nationally competitive in its academic fields as it's been on its athletic fields. I reached in and I pulled down an index card. I said, U.S. News and World Report ranks 135 universities. There are only 19 that have fewer resources per student than the University of Arkansas. Let me tell you who they are. I read off the list. I said, that's not a pack of dogs I'm going to run with. You're going to have to convince me that there's going to be a commitment to excellence in higher education in this state for me to come back home. So I went back and I told her, we won't hear from them again. <laughs> I know I scared them to death. And would you know, we became the Chancellor and First Lady of the University of Arkansas. But when Alan offered me the job, I said, two conditions, Alan. I said, what's that? I said, number one, I'll continue to teach. He said, I'll see how I can teach and be Chancellor. I said, I don't see how I can be Chancellor. Why? I said, three reasons. Number one, it'll send a message to the faculty about my commitment to undergraduate education because I'm going to be trying to build the graduate research program here. And I don't want anyone ever doubting where my heart is with respect to undergraduate students. Number two, it keeps me in touch with the kids. That's the whole reason I'm in higher education. It's about the students for me. They come first. They're first, second, and third in my rankings. And number three, it'll be the best three hours of my week. And if I can have those three hours, I might be able to put up with the rest of the stuff I have to put up with. I said, I know it can be done. Paul Torgerson did it at Virginia Tech as dean, and I taught when I was dean. And he did it as president, and I can do it and be chancellor. I said, well, let's try it. And so I never got any criticism with that. What's the next condition? I said, six families will support my goal of making the University of Arkansas as nationally competitive in its academic fields, as been on its athletic fields. He said, who are they? I said, the Waltons, the Tysons, the Dillards, the Stevens, Joe Ford, and the Murphy family, Murphy Oil in South Arkansas said, what if they won't all agree? He said, I'm not coming. When I, we can't get where we need to get off the backs of taxpayers and off the backs of parents and paying student tuition and all that. We've got to have private support. We're going to have to have a lot of it to get where we need to get. I don't know how long it'll take. I said, you let me know and I'll let you know the, my decision. So he called. And in fact, we were in Hilton Head at our vacation home and our son was visiting. And Alan said, all agreed. 
So I called my son and I said, John, you need to sit down. I've got something to tell you. What's that, Dad? I said, Mom and I are going to Arkansas. He said, really? What are you going to do about your football and basketball tickets? I said, we'll continue to get them and you can use them. Good. Congratulations, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tell me that we'd be there for five years, and so here we are. 22 years later, when I retired May 13th, we'd finished up 22. If I'd waited to retire in December, we would have spent exactly the same amount of time at Arkansas that I did at Georgia Tech. But little did I know that my 22 years would be equally divided in being chancellor for 11 years and then distinguished professor for 11 years. And let me tell you, the last 11 were far happier times. <laughs> Enjoyed those far more. The first 11, those were not 11 normal years. They were not 11 dog years. They were 11 hog years. <laughs> uh, and uh, it, it, huh. so my greatest challenge uh, when I came as chancellor was changing uh, attitudes and expectations. They were very pleased that, to see that they say we're the best university in the state. Sound familiar? best engineering program in the South, right? So I had to change attitudes internally and I had to change attitudes externally. So as we would go around to all those civic clubs and I had way too much cold broiled chicken and wilted <laughs> lettuce and Thousand Island dressing and stuff, I mean, it, but I would say to the people, who do you want the University of Arkansas to compete with in basketball? And they'd say, Kentucky and Duke and Carolina. Who do you want the University of Arkansas to compete with in football? And they would say, Texas and Michigan and Florida and da-da-da. Who do you want the University of Arkansas to compete with in history? And there was silence. In English and math. And then someone would say, Princeton and Yale. And so on it would go. I said, we're going to do it both ways. You can be nationally competitive athletically and nationally competitive academically. If you look year after year, the top public universities in the country who are very strong in academics year in and year out are also highly ranked academically. Because very few of those student athletes really have a goal about going pro. They're going to get a great education. And so that's the focus we're going to do. It's just opposite sides of the same coin. And so we're going to go after both. So what I had to use was a strategy of differentiation and association. I had to differentiate us from every other university in the state and had to associate us with national public research universities. So I started out then with a progress report. It was basically a report card on us and I identified all kinds of measures and I set goals for the year 2010 and where we were at 1997. Metrics that we could track. And I even came out with a, for, I did a first benchmark set, but I included both the publics and the privates among the four athletic conferences of ACC, Big 10, Big 12, and SEC. And then I realized it didn't make any sense to include the privates in there. And so I threw them out and added the PAC and then added Big East and put in and got 54 public universities. But before I went there, I pointed out to people, we are last in six-year graduation rate, but we were not, well, we were next to last in ACT, or equivalent scores, that's SAT, ACT, figuring out metric there. So I said, okay, let's go after now the bigger one and set these goals and off we went and as it turned out, every year I'd show them the results. And what we found was in order to increase our six-year graduation rate, the best measure we could find was what's freshman retention rate. Freshman retention rate had the highest correlation with six-year graduation rate of all other things that we could identify. So then we had to find out what can we do to increase our freshman retention rate. So we proceeded to down that road. And off we went. So then we get to the point where in 2007, in the fall, when I put that together, which was the last time before I stepped down as chancellor in June of, of 08, uh, we had come a long way. Uh, people thought we were crazy when we set those goals initially, just like all but two of those department heads laughed at the five-year goals back when I was dean. 
But at any rate, we, we came a long way in that period of time. And certainly we were helped immensely by the campaign for the 21st century, where we raised over a billion dollars, as Tish mentioned, and she's already told you about that. And then I also set up a 2010 commission. Not only do we need the public support, we need to try to get more, I mean, private support, we need to get more public support from the state. Didn't do so well there. But 92, I invited 93 people to serve and 92 accepted. Only one person said no. It's because he had a conflict with when the first meeting was going to be. He said, I don't want to be in it on name only. Well, at, I went in and asked people to come. We'll have, have a meeting. We'll write a report. I, and I anticipated what their reaction would be. Once we met, I gave them all the information. They said, we can't get this done in one meeting or one report. We're going to have to meet. meet. I said, okay, well, I already had the titles of the reports outlined in my mind. And so the first one was making the case. Two years later, picking up the pace. Two years later, gaining ground. Two years later, raising the bar. And had I stayed on this chancellor, the next one was going to be going for the gold because it was a year of the Olympics. And so already had it sort of set out what we would be doing over that 10-year period to get there. And uh, we, we made a lot of progress. My last campus faculty report in November of 07, I shared again what our vision was and that what our five goals were, and the need for us to continue to stay the course, that we had our priorities and we had our challenges, and it was very important we continue to deliver the message. And then, closing thoughts, there are many reasons to feel good about what's been accomplished. However, we dare not rest on our laurels. Much remains to be done. We stay the course. We must be more attentive and responsive to new and emerging opportunities. And then I stepped down in 08 and returned full time to the classroom and um, had a great time. Uh, so what are my 56 year insights gained over this time? Well, first you have to recognize that Miles Law says where you stand depends on where you sit. So my view of the world is based on my rear view mirror. It's based on where I've been and what I've experienced that what I see is going to be different than what you see. My, my definition of truth is going to be different from your definition of truth because our experiences are so different. And so my insights may not play well with you, but let me share them with you anyway. With respect to teaching, my keys to A's in teaching. First, it's about attitude. It's about attitude. I gave a talk at the Pocono Manors in Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania, and after, this was an after-dinner speech, and I'd never been heckled before, but I was. There was a guy who was drunk, and he wanted, decided he wanted to be the banquet speaker, so he tried as best he could, and I persisted as best I could. And afterwards, a young Air Force officer came up to me, and he said, you shouldn't pay any attention to Ralph. During the cocktail hour, I asked him, Ralph, which do you think is worse, ignorance or indifference? And he said, I don't know, and I don't care. Well, you know, the worst one of those is clearly indifference. I mean, it really is. Having a positive attitude can carry you so far. Uh, and Winston Churchill said it well. Attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. Frank Broyles, our athletic, athletics director, told me early on as chancellor, he said, Chancellor, you need to have an attitude of gratitude. And I tried as best I could to have an attitude of gratitude. But you know what's interesting in this morning's USA Today on page 2C, there's a quote there from Gary Woodland who won the US Open Championship on Father's Day on Sunday. And he said, and I'm leaving a few words out, he said, positive energy is contagious. Life is full of ups and downs and the only thing you can control is your attitude. That is so important. So it starts with attitude and then there's aspiration I hadn't realized how much of an impact the speech I gave at my high school commencement was going to have. I used a quotation of Thoreau in that speech, and it went like this. If you built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That's where they should be. Now put foundations under them. To aim high, to have lofty goals, even if all but two of the department heads would laugh when you shared them. Even if most of the faculty, all the deans and the vice chancellors would think you're crazy, 
when you set out 2010 goals that people thought were unreachable. While I was at Georgia Tech, I loved to read Louis Grissard. He was a columnist for the Atlanta Journal of Constitution magazine, or newspaper, but he wrote a lot of funny books. The funniest things about the books were usually the titles of the books, but he wrote one of those books that just seemed to just say it so well. Shoot low, boys. They're riding Shetland ponies. <laughs> that too often I think we're shooting low because we think they're riding Shetland ponies. We need to aim much higher, much higher. And I wanted my students to aim higher. And I let them know that I had very high expectations of them. And I let them know that I believed that they were capable of greatness. And one of the things over my 56 years that I've learned is I could never set higher goals for my students than they could reach. They are capable of so much more than they think they are capable of. So I tried to stretch them beyond a point that they thought was their breaking point. And afterwards they realized, I have learned so much. I'm capable of doing so much more than I thought I could do. There's also availability is so important. Woody Allen said it well, though 80% of success is showing up. We need to be available to our students. They are hungering, hungering to talk to someone about things, to ask questions, to just let them know that you care. Little things mean a lot, like a smile when you walk into the classroom the first day. Your attitude makes such a difference, and how you come across and connect with your students is so critical to them. Little things do make a difference. As I was finishing up my three years at the National Science Foundation, they had a, a reception for me to thank me for being there for the three years. Everyone left except three African-American women who were, well, they didn't have the title of secretaries, but they, were, they had jobs that were traditionally called secretarial positions. One of them was crying, and I went over to her, and I said, what's wrong? She said, oh, Dr. White, I'm going to miss you. I said, oh, look, Joe Bordonia is going to eat. I knew him. he was chair of my advisory committee. He was coming in to succeed me. I said, Joe is going to do a great job. He was dean of engineering at Penn, and, and he, he's going to do a great job. She said, oh, no, Dr. White, you don't understand. You're the only person who ever sent me a birthday card. Each, each, I would go out and go just shopping. I'd buy birthday cards. And I, every year I would hand write a little note to everyone in the engineering directorate and send her a birthday card. She had all three of my birthday cards pinned up in her cubicle. Little things mean a lot. Mary Liv was going in to have a heart maker defibrillator in Washington Regional Hospital and I looked up and a young man came into the room. He said, Chancellor White, you won't remember me. You stopped and picked me up one day. It was raining. I said, you stopped, you parked in the pit. You had a backpack. I tried to get you to put it in the back seat, but you put it in the floorboard. I took you over to Bell Engineering. He said, yes, I did. He said, I majored in electrical engineering. Went to work with Medtronic in Tulsa. Recently was transferred. In fact, I'm not assigned to Washington Regional. I'm assigned to the VA hospital. But when I saw that your wife was coming in to have this done, I wanted to be here for her because you were there for me. Little things mean a lot. It sticks with the students. If you say something unkind and cruel, it has such an impact. So little things mean a lot. But also there's accountability. We need to be accountable. You know, they people are counting on us. They're supporting us to provide quality education to these young people. And the price of greatness is responsibility. If we want to be great, we've got to be responsible. If you can't stand the heat, then you better get out of the kitchen. And then there's allocation. We, we're juggling lots of balls. And Ben Franklin said, by failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail. Well, we're juggling lots of balls. Ambition is another one, a key to an A. But it's let ambition be for your students, not yourself. 
have high expectations and ambitions for your students. Do everything you can to help them succeed. Strive to be the best teacher you can be. Be demanding, but empathetic. I'm often pleased, but never satisfied. My staff figured that out very quickly. I mean, when Mike Thomas called to congratulate me on the uh, idea, yeah, I said, not it's within our grasp. We could be in the top three. You can't even take, no, often pleased, but not satisfied. And that's just the curse of being an industrial engineer is the continuous improvement genes that we, we have. So then there's affirmation. We need to affirm our students. Teddy Roosevelt said it well. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. I make sure my students know how much I care. First day of class, I tell them, I care. If you have something you need to talk to someone you think no one cares, I do. You come see me. I'll be there for you. I'll pay attention to see if you're coming to class or not. If you're not, I'm going to be in contact with you. And I'm glad I did that. In your economy class, I noticed that one young man had not been there for three days. I contacted him. Turned out, a young African American who was gay, and his life had been threatened. And he was considering suicide. And uh, he came and met with me, and he graduated. And a great young man. I'm glad I noticed he wasn't there. It's really important that you let your students know you care. And then anticipate. Try to anticipate. I love this. I, I read Winnie the Pooh books to our daughter. She was growing up. Well said, Pooh. What I like best, and then he had to stop and think, because although eating honey was a very good thing to do, there was a moment just before you began to eat it, which was better than when you were. But he didn't know what it was called. But we do. It's anticipation. Anticipation. I look forward with anticipation to every new semester coming along and my opportunity to have an impact on the lives of those young people. Because that's what I want my legacy to be not to be measured in dollars and cents, but lives touched, of making a difference in the lives of young people. Jim Rohn said there are two ways to face the future. One is with apprehension, the other is with anticipation. As for me, I choose anticipation. Then there's awareness, and we need to be aware that our students have got lots of challenges, but if we're going to be aware of them, first we've got to be self-aware. We cannot understand what's going on with others unless we can understand what's going on with us. It's all about EQ. It's not about IQ. You need to know your strengths and your weaknesses and play your strengths. I was on a flight from New Orleans back to when I was at, at Virginia Tech. It was going from New Orleans to Atlanta and then changing planes to go on up to Roanoke. I was seated in the center seat. And the guy on the aisle seat, as it turned out, was the number one player, number world's number one handball player. I don't know how he must have told me that because I wasn't a handball player. But he asked me, do you play handball? And I said, no, I have a reoccurring dislocation of the left shoulder. I play racquetball. He said, I'm going to give you three piece of advice. If you follow it, it's going to improve, it's going to improve your game. He said, this will be true whether you play tennis or squash or badminton, whatever, these three things. Number one, play to your strength. Play to your strength. Usually it's your forehand. So run around and take 70% of the shots on your forehand. Don't try to make your your weakness as strong as your strength because your strength will get weaker as a result of that. So play to your strengths. Hmm. Makes sense to me. Number two, play with people better than you. It raises your game. Don't just play with people you can always beat. That made sense. Number three, he said, hit every serve and every shot to your opponent's weakness. It's probably the backhand. Well, hmm. 
So I go back. Tommy Carpenito was my graduate student, and he was a football player. In fact, he was a linebacker at Virginia Tech. He was an academic All-American, bright young man, highly competitive. He was smart enough that he would keep me in the game, but he was competitive enough he'd never let me win. <laughs> Tommy would, you know, he'd toy with me. I could tell you. Toy with me. I got to let, let this old guy have us. Give him a point. Give him a point. Yeah. Never just sort of skunked me if he ever wanted to graduate. <laughs> so I decided I will hit every serve to his backhand. I'll hit every shot to his backhand. See how it works. I won the first game. I've never won a game off of Tommy. Never had. I mean, I hadn't even been close, and I won the first game. I'm in the second game. And I've got him 9-0. And I served a little baby lob to his back end. He missed it, smashed the racket against the wall of the court, and walked off and never played with me again. <laughs> From that, I drew a couple of conclusions. One, I should play to my strengths. I should try to play with people better than I was. But there are some tactics that aren't worth using if it's going to cost you a friend. So there's no reason to sort of destroy him. However, it turns out <laughs> that as dean and as chancellor, I used those lessons. We played to our strengths. At Georgia Tech, I had a strategic advantage and we played to it big time. To the point that Chuck Vest at MIT sent Earl Merman, who was the head of the aerospace department head at MIT, down to meet with me when I was dean to find out why is it that the best African-American undergraduates at MIT are choosing to come to Georgia Tech for graduate school rather than stay at MIT? And I said, Earl, it hadn't got a thing to do with Georgia Tech and MIT. It has to do with Boston and Atlanta said, I have a strategic advantage over you. There's a group here in Atlanta called the 100 Black Men, and they are recruiting for me. Andrew Young will pick up the phone and call a young African-American doctoral student somewhere and say, we need you in Atlanta. Now, why don't you consider coming to Georgia Tech? I had a strategic advantage that we were not going to give up. So I played to our strengths big time. And there were some occasions when I was tempted to hit every shot and every serve to my opponent's weakness, but I tried to just play with those better than I saw. Set up each department had to go through and identify a benchmark set that they would benchmark against. These were aspirational peers. And we gathered data, and we looked through it, everything. All of that business I did as chancellor, I had done that as dean at Georgia Tech to see how they stacked up. In material science and engineering, they were, they were the faculty on average were doing between $150,000 and $200,000 a year in funded research. But after they did the, the benchmarking, which I forced everyone to do, they realized that the aspirational peers were 300 to 500,000 per, and they saw what it took to be counted in that number. And wouldn't you know, they got there. They got there. And Ashok Saxena, who was the head of that program, he came to be our dean, and he understood that very well, that you just need to set the goals and set the bar and get some data to let people see you're not just making up numbers. You're not just pulling them out of the air. And uh, I know that you can't measure everything, but it helps if you're measuring stuff and people can see they're making progress. Because then you can see that the ship is beginning to turn and boy, then momentum begins to pick up. And then you can really make the progress. 
And so while people were laughing about the progress report stuff, as they began to see that things were changing, then suddenly it picked up and went more and more. So attentiveness to your students. Be attentive. Let You have to realize they're juggling lots of balls. And I tell my students, I know you're juggling lots of balls. Some of those balls are crystal and some of those are rubber. And the ones that are rubber will bounce right back. But don't you dare drop those crystal balls. I'm talking about your health and your relationships. Those things are far more important than what you make on a test with me. What you're doing with me is a rubber ball, okay? You pay attention to those crystal balls. So here we are in a class I was teaching in the fall, getting ready for the midterm exam. Take a break, but so we'll start do the midterm. And one of the girls in the class, suddenly she's in the women's restroom crying her eyes out because she just got a text message about her brother. So I told her, I said, look, you can take this test another time. Your brother, that's a crystal ball. You focus on that. You go get yourself together. You let me know. We'll do the test another time. Well, she insisted on coming in and taking the test and, and all. But the year before, same thing happened with another one of the students. This, she turned out to be one of our swimmers. And she got a call. And it was about a brother with cancer and all. It happened just, happened just on the time of the exam, would you believe? So I said, go home and give you a test another time. I mean, we have to realize that kids are dealing with so much stuff now. They're, they've just got so many challenges facing them. So we need to be attentive to that. That means that we need to have feedback. So what I would do, the, the large classes that I would teach, there would be a stack of index cards at the back of the room. I'd encourage students, pick up an index card, put on one side, what's the most important thing you learned today? And on the back, what would you like for me to talk about next time? The first 10 minutes of the class are yours. I'll talk about anything you want to talk about. Okay? Wouldn't you know that they didn't ever ask me to talk about anything having to do with the subject of the course? It was things about life. How'd you meet your wife? Are you a Democrat or Republican? How much money do you make? Do you really know the Clintons? Yeah. When I go for an interview, should I wear a dress or a skirt or a suit? How many ties do you own? How many suits do you own? Where do you go and buy? What kind of car do you drive? I mean, all these things. How many kids do you have? What do they do? Now, there all these things that they just want to know. Well, one of the neat things about it was Kids didn't show up to my class late. They wanted to hear the first 10 minutes. They might leave early, but they sure got there early. <laughs> they, they didn't show up late. So, you know, just getting feedback. And so that's, that's the thing that's so important. And then be authentic. Be authentic. Uh, George Fisher, who was the, the chairman and CEO at Motorola, told a, a friend of mine, said, you can only be the second best somebody else. So you got to be yourself. Be yourself. Be you. Don't try to be me. Don't try to go in and teach the way I teach. You've got to teach the way you teach. Play to your strengths. Don't play to my strengths. Play to your strengths. And uh, go in and be authentic. And then be adaptable. Be adaptable. That means if things aren't going according to plan, you, it, there's nothing wrong in changing the syllabus. Okay? And changing your plans about when the tests are going to be and when the homeworks are due. Recognize the students are got, they got a lot of stuff going on. I don't know why we can't get our acts together so that we know when our colleagues are giving tests so we don't just give all our tests all in the same week and the same times. But, you know, you would think that engineers would be able to figure that stuff out. So we've got to be able to adapt. And John Wooden, a coach, a longtime coach at UCLA, said adaptability is being able to adjust to any situation at any given time, and that's what we have to be prepared to do as teachers. And then never forget that we are thespians. We are on stage. We are on stage. And so all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. 
And so if we're having a bad day, we shouldn't let it show. We shouldn't come into the classroom and carry over to them all the stuff that just, just happened to us that's got us all upset and mad. Because leaders are remembered for their worst days, not their best or average days. If you don't believe that, what's the first thing that pops into your mind when I say Bill Clinton? Okay? Well, the same thing is true of teachers, okay? That we have to be on our best behavior when we're in that classroom and with those kids. We need to praise them publicly and discipline privately. Chewing out a student in a class is, that's, every other student is saying, if she or he would do that, to, would do that to me. You know? As we go through life, our friends come and go, but our enemies accumulate. Okay? And the flow is generally in one direction. Okay? Uh, and then the final key to an A. The final key to an A is ability. Often we think that should come first, but no, it really comes last. Virgil said it well, though they are able because they think they are able. Henry Ford says, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're right. See, it comes all the way back to attitude. It comes full circle. Those were my keys to A's in teaching. Let me share a treasured teaching moment with you, and it occurred during fall semester. A course that I was privileged to develop and, and conduct was a leadership principles and practices that was on Tuesday evenings from six to nine. The first hour to hour and a half, we'd have a guest leader in and the students would be able to ask any questions they wanted of that individual. And then the last half of it, I would talk about my leadership journey and we would cover leadership books that were assigned and so forth. And I, I did it for nine times, nine times. Uh, and so in my ninth offering uh, is when this treasured moment would come. Uh, over, over the years, students were very consistent in what they said about the course. This is what they posted online in the evaluation system. They said it's the most demanding course I've taken. I worked them like dogs. I really did. I, would, I mean, I worked them like dogs. If you don't believe it, I had Tisha's daughter in the course in the fall, and I think that Rachel would say that she got a good workout. Now, she wouldn't want to say to her civil engineering colleagues that it was the most demanding course that she ever took, <laughs> but they would, so I don't know that she said that, but in general, that's what came through in the evaluations. And then they said, it's the best course I've taken. But then importantly, they said, and it changed my life. But in the fall, I had a student who wrote the following in the, and posted it on the online evaluation system. Professor White said it'd be the most demanding course I would take, and he was right. He said it would be the best course I would take, and he was right. He said that it would change my life, and it didn't. It saved my life. I thought, what a way to bring my career to a close. Now, what about research, some insights gained? Well, there were a couple of defining moments that certainly impacted my research record. One of those was Mike Thomas, my department head at, at Georgia Tech. When he came, I was in charge of the material handling short course continuing education thing. He said, you know, John, you really ought to, you shouldn't do that. It's not gonna help you build your research record, you really need to get focused on research and, and all. And I, I said, Mike, this is really important. I'm going to continue to do it. it the course had basically it had dissolved. And when I came, Bob Lair, then the department had said, would you take this on, see if you can breathe some life into it? And we did. In fact, we got to the point that we would turn down registrations, it kept it at 100, made a lot of money, which provided the money for faculty to travel to conferences and all kinds of things. And bought all kinds of computers and stuff for the department and, and all, but um, I just stayed with that. 
And through that, my reputation developed across campus to the point that one day, a young man walked into my office there. I had no clue who this guy was. His name was Dale Atkins. He worked at G GTRI, the Georgia Tech Research Institute. He had a, a master's degree, was working with the poultry industry to try to, it was basically like uh, uh, the experiment station and all in ag, but this was for engineering. They'd go out and they'd work with the businesses and try to help them be more productive and, and all. And, and Dale came to see me and he said, I've heard about a program at the National Science Foundation and uh, about an industry university cooperative research center program and I thought it would be good to put together a proposal to do something for the poultry industry. And when I talked to people in the poultry industry, uh, one of their issues was about material handling. And as I asked, get, began to get more and more information about it, I've heard that you know stuff about material handling. And he said, and I don't know anything about material handling. Uh, would you be interested in working with me to develop a center for material handling for the poultry industry. And I said, I'd be interested in working on a center for material handling, but not for the poultry industry. I think it ought to be open to all industry because then I told him about the material handling short course and all of these things that were going on. Told him about my consulting company and that I was drawing on my consulting clients to come and populate the short course. And I thought I could get them to support our research center and all. And he said, oh my. He said, well, let's go to NSF and let's go meet with and talk. So we went. And uh, I'll never forget uh, one of the, the, the division director there he said, well, he said, White, uh, never thought material handling would be a subject for a research center, but I like your spunk. He said, let's give you a planning grant and see what you can do with it. Well, to make a long story much shorter, we, we overachieved our five-year goals in the first six months and had to turn off industry memberships. It became the most successful IUCRC NSF it had, and it then wound up bringing me to the attention of Eric Block, the director of the National Science Foundation. Uh, it, play, it had a lot to do with my having the opportunity to go to NSF and, and head up the interim directorate. Uh, so it, sometimes you need to just follow where your heart is leading you about research. And in that case, I just continued to do what I was doing with the short course and everything else, but let me continue with some research insights. Research is not the enemy of good teaching. There are those who want to cast it in that way. I, can, I say it's not. In fact, Paul Torgerson helped me with that as well. He said that he went through when he was dean at Virginia Tech and he took faculty and put the faculty in two stacks. Those that were, had a reputation for excellence in teaching and those who did not. And he found out the stacks were almost identical when he said those that are active in research and those who are not. That the ones who are really, really active in research want to ensure that what they're teaching is really up to date and they are going to continue to upgrade and do and so they become better teachers. It's, I thought that it was put very well that Research is the spring that keeps the lake from becoming stagnant. And so you need research involved if you're doing your teaching, that you don't want to just continue to teach the same old stuff over and over and over. Uh, and it's important to involve undergraduate students in your research. I mean, there are several reasons to do that. One, it's the absolutely the best way to recruit young people to go to graduate school they get involved in undergraduate research, you should pretty much got them hooked. Why? Because they experience the joy of discovery. To realize they know something that no one else in the world knows. They get it. And so they are pretty well hooked. And then you need to explore the boundaries and intersections of disciplines and not just sort of stay in your rut. Don't enjoy your rut so much you decide you want to carpet your rut and just be right there in my rut. Uh, define research quality very broadly. Don't get into this business, well, well, is it theoretical or is it applied? Is it this? I mean, research. It's discovering new things. And then with respect to service, internal service is critically important in terms of how your colleagues 
to you and what they say about you. But external service was the thing that really, really helped me tremendously. Uh, it was through my involvement, through the Institute of Industrial Engineers, becoming the president of that, and then getting into the American uh, Association for Engineering Societies, AES, where all of the engineering societies were together, that then when I became chairman of that body, then all of those engineering societies recommended me to NSF for the engineering AD position. The electricals did, the civils did, all of them, mechanicals, chemicals, the ags, all of them, because they had seen me operate, they knew me, and so just the stuff that happened there. Also, it turns out that just uh, my involvement in the church and leadership activities, my involvement in the professional societies and leadership activities, all those things equipped me to take on leadership positions. It's the networking opportunities to, and to say to the students, look, build your network, start now, continue, keep your network going. Bill Boys Club, yeah. People ask, how did you get to be a director of Motorola, of Eastman Chemical, Russell Corporation, Agility, J.B. Hunt? It was all because of people that I knew, that they knew me. So the networking is so critical. Um, and then comes administration, some insights gained from that, lessons learned, if you will. Bloom where you're planted. What that, my, what that means for me is do the bo job you've got now the best of your ability. Don't be trying to do your job with an eye on the, eye on the next job. The more you're thinking about the next job, the less you're thinking about the current job. And you will build your reputation because of the excellent work you do where you are. Bloom where you're planted. Let opportunities come to you. Let them seek you. You know, instead of you seeking them. Uh, it's, uh, it's a hard lesson for some. My provost learned it the hard way, Bob Smith. He wanted to be a university president in the worst way. He applied for many of them. He was never selected. In fact, he was in for, I, I recommend him for the vice, and, and Georgia, they title things the opposite of what we do in Arkansas. The president of the system in Arkansas is called the chancellor in Georgia of the system. So the vice chancellor for academic affairs position was open. Bob applied for it, was selected. Well, the search firm that was doing the work, I knew because they had done some work for me while I was chancellor, so I called the head of the firm. I said, what's going on? He said he wanted the job too much. He came in, he was overprepared. I mean, he, you need to be hard to get as opposed to trying everything you can to get it. It came across that he was almost desperate to get the job. So I had a discussion with him. So then the next thing that came up for him, he became a reluctant candidate and he got the job. Uh, <laughs> continuously improve. Beware of type one and type two errors. A type one error is rejecting someone when you should have accepted. And a type two is accepting someone when you should have rejected. I have made a lot of those errors. I made them especially with basketball coaches. <laughs> and the, the type two errors are very visible when you hire someone that you shouldn't have hired. Fortunately, people don't know who I didn't hire. If they knew that, I would have really been in trouble because two of those, have, one has won a national championship and the other has been to two final fours. But uh, fortunately, people don't know. <laughs> know yourself your values, your strengths, and your weaknesses. Strive to be a leader of the best team, not the best leader of a team. Focus is on the team, not on you. Focus on the windshield, not the rearview mirror. Don't spend all your time saying, what if, what if. Big difference in decisions and outcomes. You can have good decisions, bad decisions. You can have good outcomes and bad outcomes. My belief is once you make the decision, do everything you can to ensure the outcome is positive. Just focus all of that. Don't go back second guessing, should I have made that decision? Decisions made. So get information and trust your gut. Surround yourself with smart, experienced, diverse people. Define success throughout your journey. It's going to change as you go through your career. My definition of success today is very different than it was when I first started out. 
Be an encourager, not a discourager. Maintain a healthy balance of tension in the organization. Newton's laws apply to organizations as well. No tension, it stays at rest. If you're gonna move the organization, you're gonna to have to have some tension. Celebrate teaching, research, and service successes of the people on your team. Set lofty goals and stay the course. Recognize the role that luck plays. Finally, the two words most anticipated in my presentations in closing. <laughs> Machiavelli, I think, had it pretty, pretty correctly when he, he wrote, fortune is the arbiter of one half of our actions, but she still leaves us to direct the other half, or perhaps a little less. Luck can play a big role. Fortune, destiny, whatever you want to call it, because what if Buck Newsom and Herb Manning had canceled their fishing trip? I never would have become the chancellor of the University of Arkansas. Wouldn't have happened. Would not have happened. What if I'd chosen to go to Purdue instead of Georgia Tech? Who knows what would have happened? But it would certainly have been very different. Could still have been really, really good. Could have been great. Could have enjoyed it, but it had been very different. What if I had followed Mike Thomas' advice and hadn't continued with the material handling short course? What if Dale Adkins hadn't chosen to come see me that day and told me about NSF's IUCRC program that I had no clue about whatsoever? What if I hadn't gone to NSF? What if I had gone to Florida to be the dean and hadn't liked it? If I'd become a gator instead of a hog? <laughs> what if I'd ignored Mary Lib's advice? Never would I have ignored Mary Lib's advice. Uh, bless her heart, she has put up with a lot all these years with me. But let me end by saying this, thank you. Thank you especially, thank you, and I cannot get it to go there, it wouldn't go there, but the, what it was going to do at the end was thank you especially to all of those who have had an influence on in my journey, especially the students. I love you. Thank you very much.